Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hello Museum Families, everyone. Welcome to RBC sorry, at Home sorry, Kids. Kim, can I just can I just interrupt for a second? Okay. You didn't actually, go live to Facebook. So. Oh well, that's very strange. I guess it's um, I guess it didn't work because I it was on that screen. Can maybe give it one more try. Mm, sure. Yeah, it's on the go live page, but it won't. I'm not, it's not clicking go live for me. Go live is blacked out. Chris, if I make you, ho oh, if I make you host, can you give it a try? Chris, I don't know if you're still there. Yeah, if you make me oh. host, I'll give it a try. Okay, thank you. Sorry, everybody, we are just working through a few things here. And if it's okay, Chris, we're going to start and we'll just have live join us when our Facebook join us when they're able to. So hello, museum families, and welcome to RBC at Home Kids, a play date on screens across British Columbia and around the world. The previous sessions are recorded, and you can find them on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. My name is Kim Goff, and I'm filling in today for your regular host, Chris O'Connor. Like Chris, I'm a museum program developer at the Royal BC Museum. The museum in my home is located in Victoria, British Columbia, on the territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, the Lekwungen and I'm grateful to be able to live and work on this land. Right now, the Royal BC Museum has a special exhibition by the celebrated artist, Emily Carr. In addition to the beautiful paintings, some of which are on loan from other museums and galleries, we have included a special edition of works, including a number of beautiful portraits from the BC archives. To talk to us more about portraits and the style of Emily Carr is our special guest, Jerry Engen. Jerry has been working in art education for over 25 years in schools, galleries, museums, community and community art organizations, and teaching in her own studio, Kazoo Studio. This is her third session with us. The first time was about communicating through sharing words and images on postcards. The second time was about painting forests. And this time we're talking about portraits. So Jerry, now I've used that word portraits a few times. Perhaps we should define what a portrait is. Yes, so a portrait is a picture of somebody or a painting, a sculpture, but we're going to be looking at drawings today and maybe adding a little painting. So portrait is of somebody else. A self-portrait is a portrait of you. So you may choose today to do a portrait of a friend or a family member or you might choose to do a self-portrait. Like I can see myself in the screen today. So if you can see yourself in the screen, maybe you're just going to use your own face for reference. Reference means um, what you're pulling from, like what information you're trying, you're looking at to put onto your paper. Excellent. And Emily Carr um, maybe isn't as well known for her portraits. It's not something that she did a lot of, but she did include people in, in some of her works. And pieces. And I was mentioning that in our collection at the museum or in the exhibit that's at the museum right now, we do have um, some of her work there. And one of the pieces that we have um, is, a, is this portrait right here, which I think is a really lovely little portrait. This is by Emily Carr. It was likely painted sometime between 1906 and 1908. And the name of the painting is Likely Rosie Dan. So this painting has been given a name afterwards by uh, perhaps by some of our archivists or maybe even our curator of um, arts and images here at the museum. And Rosie Dan is the name of the little girl. And Rosie's mother was a friend of Emily's car, Emily Carr's. So this is a watercolor that's been painted. Uh, what do you see when you look at this painting, Jerry? What does it make you think of? Oh, what does it make me think of? Well, I think she looks as if she's been, you know, she's definitely been placed. Um, 
making some decisions because like all things that Emily Carr is doing, she's playing with abstraction and that's kind of what we've been talking about over the three sessions. So we look, she, we've seen that she simplified details and maybe taken things down to shape. So is that a log? Um, I think it maybe is kind of a log that the little girl has been sat on. Um, and obviously she looks like, to me, she kind of looks very proud as if she's very excited to have uh, her portrait painted in watercolor. But mm -hmm. lots of the detail is gone. I can kind of make, um, I can see enough to think that maybe she has wrapped herself uh, in a shawl. Maybe there's a plaid on the shawl from the red lines that I see. Um, is that a petticoat under her? So it's kind of interesting in that one of the things about paintings is a way to look at what life was like before, uh, not when we're here. So we can kind of look at our clothing and see what a child was wearing back in the early 1900s, which isn't shorts or pants, He's in a full dress <laughs> to <laughs> run around and play. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's great. Speaking, you know, uh, you mentioned a drawing. I, I mentioned uh, earlier when we were waiting that I have a portrait that my grandmother painted of me. You can see here this, and it's got a date of 1981. So speaking of the dress, you can see it looks like I'm wearing blue jeans and sneakers, and a short sleeve shirt with stripes on it. And it says it's July, so this is an outfit, a summer kind of outfit. Probably later with shorts or something else. But yeah, it gives you an idea of what people dressed and what we were doing at the time as well. Right. So Jerry, I'm going to highlight your screen so everyone can um, get drawing and working on those portraits with you. Perfect. So um, one of the things that, that your exhibition is talking about is, is her time in France. And um, one of the things that she would have been in seeing while she was there was the Favis, the uh, a movement um, where artists were painting in wild beast colors. So maybe today that's one of the ways you wanna think about abstracting um, because color artists can use to create um, emotions or personalities. So if I was silly, I might color myself in pink. And if I was feeling calm, if I was a very calm person, maybe I would do myself in blues. But if you want to maybe think about like a Favis to color yourself in something that is not um, maybe what is expected, uh, what we, uh, I, your, your normal skin color. So that's something we can play with today. But I thought I would quickly tell you some rules about the face because when you know about these rules, um, you can pretty much make a face drawing of whatever you want. Um, and if you know the rules, then you can also make decisions of how you wanna break the rules. So I'm gonna use my markers and I'm gonna suggest that you go ahead and bravely use your markers too, um, instead of pencil. Now, if you're not gonna be adding water, maybe then you wanna use a pencil. But the first thing you wanna look at is your face shape. So my face shape is an oval. You can kind of see here, but some of the other face shapes you might see are a circle, um, you might see somebody that has more of a square face. You might even see kind of a heart-shaped face. So you look and see what shape your face is. I think I'm gonna start with, I'm actually gonna start with blue. So I'm gonna make an oval shape here. So once I have that oval shape, I'm gonna think about halfway down. I'm gonna come halfway down my face. Believe it or not, that's where your eyes are. We have a tendency to want to put our eyes way up at the top, because we think they're at the top, but they're actually halfway down. If you look, half and half. So my head, I want to put those eyes about halfway down. The other thing I'm going to do is put a light line right down the middle, because our faces are symmetrical. That means what's happening on one side is also happening on the other. So now I know I can put those circles in on that line, but here's something interesting, is that the space between our eyes is exactly the same width of an eye. So this is our third eye right here. So I know that I have that space. That's something to remember. Now, interesting enough, all of our eyes are different. Yours are unique to you. So what I want you to look at 
is this line here. What does your eyelid do? So mine kind of goes like this, but yours might come up and go down. It might go straight across. It might go like this. So on those circles, I'm going to add that line. And then I want you to look at the line that is your eyelid. Some of our eyelids we see lots of and some we don't. If you see that, you could add that right there. Now remember, Emily Carr is simplifying. So we're not gonna put a lot of detail in. And I know I'm going very fast. So if I'm going too fast, remember this is recorded, you can watch it. But I kind of want to demo this for you and maybe you can do it on your own time. I know over those eyelids, I want to put some eyebrows. Look at the line of your eyebrow. What does yours look like? So I'll give you a second to kind of get to that point. Remember, don't worry if it's not looking like it's like you look in real life. You're creating a painting. You can take some liberties. Nobody's looking at that. So once I have this, halfway between this line and the chin, I'm going to put another line somewhere around here. That is where my nose is going to be. So some things I wanna think about is I'm going to draw a line straight down here. That tells me where the outside of my nostrils are because my nostrils line up with the corner of my eyes. And what I want you to pay attention to is not your lines of your nose, I want you to pay attention to your nostrils because everybody's shape is different. Look at how different my mine kind of goes like this. <gasps> Look at Kim's. Kim's. There, there, yeah. Hmm. So this that, is where these cameras are very helpful. We're getting a yeah. good look at ourselves. And can... <laughs> As I try to stick my finger up my nose. <laughs> so I want you to look at your nostril shape and put that in somewhere right here. And then on either side, now my nose, look at this part. Mine comes way down. Yours might not come way down. Yours might come like this. Yours might come down like this. Or yours might just come straight across, okay? So I want you to kind of look at that line and put it in. Now mine's gotten very thin, but that's okay. And then on either side, I'm just gonna put a like C shape. So remember, this line is coming. It would connect there. Now I can, if I want, bring down that nose shape here and bring it up if I want to. And I'm just gonna go ahead and color that in because there would be some shadow there. So I'm just gonna add a little color there. Wait till you see what I'm gonna do with this. So now again, I'm going to make kind of a line that's halfway between my nose and my chin and guess what that is? My mouth, but I'm not gonna draw my lips. I want you to look at the line between your lips. Look, maybe yours goes down. Mine kind of goes across, but I know it has a little lump right here. Now look where this, where your mouth ends <gasps> is at your pupils, at your eyes. So I'm gonna come out like this, and there is that middle line. And then think about your lips. Mine is very thin at the top and very big at the bottom. Yours might be very thin at the bottom and very big at the top. So take a moment and look at what your lips do, and then you can add those in. So I'm looking a little scary right now because I have no hair. <laughs> And I also, if I wanted to at this time, maybe I want to narrow things down. Maybe I will increase. You can see how I'm starting to play, but I forgot my ears. I can't hear you right now. Your ears go on the lines between, for your eye and your nose. That is where your ears sit. So there are your ears. This is great. All these um, references we can use for our proportions. Yeah. So if right. so you know, if you can like measure, wait a minute, like if I wanted to look, maybe I want to come up a little higher here, but this is where I'd start my hair and bring it down. And then and I don't want a floating head. I'm going to bring a neck in. And there we go. So I have a face. 
So now comes the fun part. You can change as you're doing it. What we do know about the face is that where things overlap, here you'd see a shadow. So I can kind of come in and add a bit of a shadow here. I know under the nose there's going to be a shadow. I know here there's a shadow. I know under my eyes there's a shadow. Why do I know this? Because look, if I feel my face, I go up, I come in. I come up, I go down. So everywhere that you're raised, that's going to be where your brightest points are. Brightest point on my nose right here, but my sides are shadowed. I have a very big shadow right here. Like you might have it, but you might not. I'm gonna go ahead and give me some pupils. And then I'm just going to have some fun. Now, I remember I was saying that you, like the Fauvis, could come in and paint, color yourself something different. I think I might be pink today. But so people, I like to think about one side dark and one side light. Sorry, Kim. I was gonna say, if people haven't seen uh, previous episodes at, or they, they're wondering a bit more about what a Fauvist or Fauvism is, that's a, a, a movement in art. Is that right, Jerry? Like a, a modern movement in art? Well, it would have been, yes, it would have been part of what Emily Carr was seeing why she was in France. She would have, and if we look at some of her paintings, that's where she starts using um, maybe colors that are unexpected in her landscapes. Um, and she starts to take some of that and use that in the way that she begins to abstract. Because although it doesn't look that unusual for us today, this was a real new modern way of painting that people had not really seen before. So they used unexpected colors to kind of share um, maybe if they were outside and they wanted you to feel the warmth, they would use really hot, warm colors. Or in this case, I'm trying to um, share with you how I'm feeling today, like what personality I want you to see. So I'm using colors that way. If you want to use regular colors, by all means. In fact, I could still come in and throw some orange in here. And what will happen is that that will start to blend when I'm blending. So maybe I'm going to look at something like this. Because I've used blue, this is going to mix in with my color. So I don't need to worry about that. When I'm coloring my lips, where you want to add your color is on the top lip, not the bottom lip, because the bottom lip sticks out. So if you look at my lip when I stop talking, you'll notice that it's highlighted right here. See? So I'm not going to color that part. I might color here, but I'm going to let that be, because this right here, this part of my chin, is what's going to define that lower lip. So that's something to have fun and play with. So I've added a bit of color. Not sure where we are for time. We're pretty good for time. Yeah, looking good. It's about 20 after. Yeah. So I'm going to come in. Now, I noticed in that portrait that Kim shared with us that she didn't put all the hair strands in. She just kind of made the shape of the color. So I'm going to think, quiet, Mommy May. I'm going to think of just throwing in some color. I'm going to put some i got some black here, but I think I'm going to have some fun with it. I think oh, I might put some purple into it. It looks a bit like a scribble now, doesn't it? But it will be okay. Now, if you weren't going to use the water on your marker, um, you would want to keep adding color over this. You might want to start thinking about the brush stroke, like if I want something to be round. I'm going to color it round by going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now, the other place I know is I need to probably add a little bit of shadow right under my chin here. But I feel like I've kind of got a bit of what I want. I'm not going to put eyelashes in, but I am going to use my black to kind of increase that line. I'm looking a little crazy right now. And I think about oh, Emily Carr did, I'm not wearing, but I'm gonna think I'm gonna put a bit of red here, almost as if I'm wearing, a, oh, I picked up orange. 
How about the art teacher who doesn't know red? There we go. I'm gonna throw in, maybe that's my plaid. Just kind of abstracting like that. If you want to put a background in, you most certainly can. We could think about some of the other things. <gasps> maybe it's a windy day and I'm going to throw in, remember how Emily Carr does her line work. I'm gonna throw in some lines for a windy day. So you're outside. I noticed there's no color on your nose and that's because that's a, that's a, when we were touching our faces earlier, that was one of the high yeah. spots in a, in a spot that maybe would reflect light. Yep, and the thing is, remember, I'm gonna add water to mine. So I want you to do this. Um, you wanna, you notice how I kind of layered color in places. Wanna make sure we got enough marker on there. But if you're doing water, here's why I didn't do that. What did I do? There's my paintbrush. Is because when I add water, now mine might drip because I'm upright. When I start adding water, look at what's happening. Now I am being thoughtful about where I'm putting the water because I want to do it carefully. But do you see how the water and O, oh, just so we're clear, I'm not dumping and painting, I am taking off the extra water. So in and like this. But what is going to start happening is I'm making my own kind of watercolor. But you see how it's going to pick up those uh -huh. colors. So that's why I didn't put it everywhere. Now you might decide you want to blend the colors and in places you might decide you don't want to blend the colors, but you can already see I'm moving around and doing this thoughtfully. I'm being very mindful of where I'm adding my water. So I'm in control. Notice I didn't move the chin right now. I am very much in Favis colors today. I'm definitely being wild beast colors. I know I wanna color that in, but I don't wanna color that nostril and I don't think. So I'm gonna let some things dry for a minute and then I can come back and add. I'm gonna go ahead and do my hair because I know I'm gonna make my hair all Interesting, I didn't put enough black into it, but that's okay. So you can see me starting to become a painting. Jerry, you're using a uh, watercolor markers and water. What else could you, what other paints might this technique work with? So you could use your acrylic paints, your tempera paints. If you actually have watercolors, you could just go ahead and try with watercolor. Um, you know, I mean, I just, everybody kind of usually has some kind of school supply markers hanging around the house. So that's why I chose to do this because I thought it might be something that everybody has. Um, but yeah, like you don't have to use markers if you have watercolors or paints, you could definitely do that. This is a project that um, I've done quite a bit in, in at Kudzu when, with kids, so, um, but, you can see how I can take that paint and really kind of see in the background here, I'm playing with that idea. I'm gonna to change to a big brush just so it goes quicker. You don't need to do this, but I want to kind of get that in for you really quickly. And you were saying earlier, if, um, if you're using thicker paper, you can use a bit more water, but if you're using thinner paper, yeah, um, it, you wanna use a little less water. Right, absolutely. So you, if you are using printer paper, what you might be finding as you scrub is that the paper is starting to break apart. So if I was using a printer paper, I'd be using very little water. So I'm just going to throw a bit on here, but not a lot. And then if I want to, I could come back in like I'm looking and saying, oh, I need to kind of come in here, just add a little bit. So and maybe I'll add a little bit there. Okay, so now what? Well, if I have pencil crayons or do I have some crayons, you could come in if you wanted to. What you don't want to do is go back with your markers um, Why your paper's wet because you'll ruin your markers. So you definitely don't want to do that, but you could come in and if you had a black, which I don't have, but I do think I have a black crayon. Have a black crayon. Jerry, um, I said in your intro you've been doing some, you've been doing teaching for 20 or 25 years, but how long have you been drawing? 
Um, I've been drawing since I was very little. It's uh, obviously I was little before the time of computers. So this was a way that I entertained myself. I um, went and into my room and uh, my favorite gift was always to get a new box of crayons. That was my very favorite present. And so I would spend an awful lot of time with just crayons and um, drawing in my room. It was one of my very favorite things to do. So, um, but I did go to art school um, in the South uh, down um, by Savannah, Georgia, and then uh, in Atlanta. So that's kind of where I'm from. And that's why my studio is called Kudzu because it's a weed that grows down that way. Oh, nice. Very famous. If you look, you'll see like they co it covers cars and houses if it's left to grow. So. Nice. Well, thanks Lucian for that question. Lucian was wondering <laughs> about when you started drawing. Yeah, so it, it truly is a doodle. Um, this is very abstracted. I've definitely embraced this idea of fauvism and using colors that are unexpected. Um, like I said, once it's dry, like up here, I can touch it now. If I wanted to, once it's dry, I could go back in with my marker. So if I wanted to, to go back in, I could come back in and make things a little more clear if I want. But only after your paper is dry, otherwise you'll ruin your marker. So you can see, I wouldn't touch it. If I can touch it and it smears, I don't want to touch that right now with the marker. But you could definitely come in if you felt like you lost too much detail and come back one more time. I kind of like this one giant eye and this one eye that is <laughs> yeah. not giant at all. <laughs> so that is again, kind of starting to abstract and play with. Yeah, I've seen abstract paintings where people have three or four eyes in them. Yeah going all different ways. Great. So what do you see when you look at the painting? What's the sort of mood that this, these colors and this um, portrait make you feel about the sitter or the, or that's you. So what kind of mood is that? Hmm. I feel like I look a little maybe calm, but kind of excited. Maybe I'm paying attention because I've got all these blues going in, which for me is a color that I think for being calm. Um, but then maybe the sunlight is shining over here. I don't know, I kind of was playing. It'd be interesting. So what does it make um, some of uh, the people who are watching us today, what do they think my personality might be in these colors? Mm, you can use the chat and say, if you, if you saw a, pic a painting like that, how would you think that person was feeling or what were they thinking that day? I see, yeah, I kind of, it's serious, but it's still, it's not, for me, it's still warm. Yeah, I look like I might be, maybe my, my daughter is giving me a little bit of a, a story about why her room's a mess, because my one eye looks like, really? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I'm getting an imaginative story of why the bed's not made today, because I kind of look like I'm a bit like, mm, not buying that idea. Proma says um, happy, energized, and sad even. Hadley says happy. Interesting. So I'm curious, did anybody uh, play with different colors for their portraits? What did, colors did they use? Yeah, let us know if you use, or maybe you have a favorite color that you always will, would like to put in a portrait of yourself. I, I like purple a lot, so I, I'd probably use colors like this one. There's some, um, thinking about colors, complementary colors come to mind and um, different colors that really, can you say a little bit about complementary colors and would it work like this? Would you think of complementary colors or just anything at all? Yeah, in fact, look at him here. Here is my quick sketch of you from my doodle that I did. But um, mm -hmm. if I, you can't really see it, but if I wanted to do complementary colors, complementary colors are what is a cross? I'm looking to see if I have a I don't see it. Uh, if you're looking at a color wheel, the complementary colors are across from each other. So across from red is green, across from yellow is purple, and across from orange is blue. So those are complementary colors. If I put them right next to each other, what it will do is it will make the colors look brighter. So look how much brighter the orange begins to look 
next to blue. Can yeah. you see that or is that really small? What's no, it is. It, the orange looks very bright. The orange looks in front of the blue. Now, Emily Carr loved um, mixing colors herself using complementary because if I mix them together, orange and blue, it will make a brown. So it will give me a brown color. So there is the brown mixing orange and blue. I hope you can see that. Mm. And if I do it with red and green, that will also give me a different color brown. That's the wrong green, let's see. Let's try this green with it. This will give me kind of, I think red and green give me the more kind of a woody brown color, but there comes brown again. So you can see that when you mix complementary colors, you will end up with browns. You can see the two different. Yeah, very browns. natural looking browns. Yeah, too. yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I'm going to hit cancel spotlight if I can. <laughs> So it really has been a while since <laughs> since I've been here. Um, no, it's gone away from me for some reason. So we're going to keep a camera there. But Hadley said uh, Hadley used pink, green, and orange, very Favis colors in their painting. Our Prasad used purple. Um, another person used red and green. So that's pretty cool too. Those are great, great, um, great paintings and great color. So thank you so much for showing us how to do portraits and teaching us about proportions and contours and colors and this blending technique, which is so fun. I'm definitely going to have to try that. Great. For everyone who joined us, thank you for um, painting alongside. And if you do, if you want to feel, 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 feel free to share one of your paintings with us, you can email us or you can share it on social media using at Royal BC Museum. And the email would be C O C O N N O R. That's for Chris O'Connor at Royal BC Museum. Next week, January the 13th, Chris will, will be back as your host, and his guest will be the Shaw Center for the Salish Sea. And together, you'll be making an underwater forest. So I hope you can join us then. And until then, take care of yourselves and one another. And thank you, Jerry, for joining us again. It has been such a treat to share with you. Thank you for having me for the last three months. I have really enjoyed it. It's been a beautiful exhibition to be uh, responding to. So thank you very much. For oh, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.